Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory lecture. Hello on Instagram and hello up here on YouTube. If you're joining me for the very first time, welcome. This is a Monday morning, 8 to 9 a.m. session that I host every every week live on YouTube and Instagram, which is dedicated to introducing some of the key concepts within so-called continental theory and philosophy, including psychoanalysis with a strong emphasis on Slavoj Žižek, Hegel, Kant, today also some Schelling, Marx, etc. If you are not new to this channel, if you are joining as a recurrent student or learner or what have you, I'm so glad that you're here. It is such a pleasure to be starting our week together in intellectual kinship. So thank you so much for being a part of this learning community and for joining me this morning. I already see some people joining from outside the US. I see the Philippines. If you'd really like to do me a favor, please do leave a comment letting me know where you're joining from. I see Colorado, Guten Morgen Deutschland, I see Korea. Uh, it's always wonderful hearing where you're joining me from. So please do leave a comment. I'm happy to give you a shout out. Um, it brings me a lot of joy knowing that we are a genuine international community of like-minded thinkers and learners. I see Dubai, I see Germany, London, Saudi Arabia, hello, Slovenia. Croatia, hello, nice to see you again. India, India, lots, lots of people joining from India, it's wonderful. Russia, good morning, Russia. Uh, Norway, New Mexico, <laughs> New Jersey, <laughs> India, that's um, incredible. That's wonderful, thank you guys so much. Nepal, that's, that's really, really inspiring to me, thank you. That means a lot. Netherlands, Huya Morcha. Um, I do want to say Scotland. I actually used to work in Scotland. Um, I used to work uh, near Stirling for a while. Okay, uh, Nigeria. Hello, Nigeria. Today we're going to be wrapping up this lecture series. Although if you're new to this channel, fret not. You can enjoy this lecture standalone. But it does tie into the previous three months, 11 lectures that, that I've taught which were all revolving around the theme of so-called spurious infinities. And spurious infinities is a Hegelian term for bad infinity, which he juxtaposes with the idea of a true infinity. And what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna try to lay out some of the key concepts within the idea of the spurious infinite, Hegel's response to Schelling. And I'm gonna to try to wrap up some of these ideas in a way that will hopefully provide you with a bit of a summary as to Hegel's thought apropos the idea of the infinitive. And this will also lay the foundation for where we are going to pick up next week, because next week we're gonna be starting right away with the following lecture series that, that draws naturally from the current one. And the lecture series that starts next week will be titled Indivisible Remainders. And so we're gonna wrap up the Spurious Infinities lecture today uh, lecture series today, and we're going to pick it up with these uh, indivisible remainders series next week. And so I'm going to start by explaining what an indivisible remainder is and how it links to the idea of a spurious infinitive. If all of that sounds like gobbledygook to you, then that is because these are very abstract, technical, philosophical concepts. However, my goal with this channel, and with these lectures above all, is to provide you with an in-depth, intuitive, introduction to some of these concepts, but to do it in a way that doesn't dumb them down, that doesn't simply turn them into sophis, sophism or, or, or rhetorical sleights of hand, if you will. And so my goal is to provide you with what I'm working on, what I'm thinking about, in a way that will hopefully be accessible to you either as a beginner or as a more advanced learner. Above all, I want to say thank you to our patrons who fund this community, both our Instagram patrons, our YouTube patrons. You guys are the, the bread and butter of this project. I simply could not do it without patrons. So thank you so, so, so much if you're a patron. And if you'd like to become a patron, there's a bunch of perks that you can access, including an ebook version of every lecture once it completes. So within a week, you will receive the ebook version of this past lecture. The Spurious Infinities will be presented as an ebook. You can also download a bonus Q&A podcast and you can participate on our Discord channel, which I host after every lecture so that we can discuss further. And to my mind, that's the most enjoyable part of every week is that I really get to answer questions and, and engage in discussion. Um, 
And then there's also transcripts for every lecture, and you can download every lecture as an audio file. So if you'd like to get the full quote unquote experience of these lectures, if you'd like to be a part of our learning community, and if you'd like to help me keep this open access educational project alive and well, please do consider becoming a patron. The link is www.patreon.com forward slash Jeneline and Julian. And I'm gonna put the link on YouTube and Instagram as well. All right, let's dive right in. Thank you guys so much. So the, the title of this lecture, I don't know if we have enough light. Do we have enough light? Is that better? The title of this lecture is The Indivisible Remainder. And the indivisible remainder is a term from the thinker Schelling. And Schelling is what you might call a vanishing mediator between Fichte and Hegel, part of the so-called Jena set. And when I say vanishing mediator, I mean it in a similar way to how Zizek characterizes this. Now, the idea of the vanishing mediator, with which you may already be familiar, is an idea that comes from Frederick Jameson. Frederick Jameson argues that the vanishing mediator is the process by which something becomes universalized and yet disappears in the process of so doing. The example that he uses historically is the manner in which the Max Weberian Protestant ethic becomes universalized in capitalism and yet leads to an increasingly secular existence. Here we have the principle, the ethic of Protestantism being carried over into its perceived opposite namely capitalist production, thereby fading away at the exact point that it becomes universalized. Too much light. Arguably, the same thing happens between Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. The way in which this is usually taught, which I don't fully agree with, but I'll get to that in a moment, is that we have within Fichte the idea of subjective idealism, the positing of the ich, the I, the self-positing of existence, juxtaposed by the Schellingian objective idealism, which is then finally synthesized by Hegel in his absolute idealism. Now, there's a couple of reasons that I don't like this way of teaching it, although it's conveniently formulaic. One, it replicates the Fichtean triad of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, thereby suggesting that Hegel is the highest form of thought deriving from the Fichtean positing of the subjective ich, or the I. What happens instead, I would argue, is more akin to the process of a vanishing mediator, the process by which the, the Fichtean problem, which is the subjective positing of the absolute, namely through finite existence, is then contradicted within the Schellingian emphasis on the absolute as an Urgrund, as a foundation underlying all finite existence, a kind of void, if you will. Of course, for Schelling, this is nature raised into the absolute. And then finally, for Hegel, we have the synthesis of these two, if you will, the process by which the Fichtean proposition of the subject becomes universalized and yet seems to fade away, the vanishing mediator, whereby subject equals object, by which the absolute is substance as subject. It's, if you will, the dialectical unfolding of the antithesis between Fichte and Schelling. Now, in order to start understanding some of these terms and why I think they're important, even if they might seem a little bit dense at first, I think it's important to highlight that Hegel defined the task of philosophy, the project of philosophy, as being the attempt to grasp the infinite. And there is an element of Platonism here. Namely, if you think about the allegory of the cave and the juxtaposition between the world of appearances within the cave and the world of truth outside the cave, then the task of the philosopher in the allegory is to exit the cave and grasp the world of truth and crucially to return to the cave and convince the others to do so as well. Truth thereby is code for the infinite Whereas what happens in the cave is code for the finite appearances, things that appear to you that are thereby necessarily limited as being finite in as much as you are finite. Thereby, the basic platonic juxtaposition is maintained between the infinite and the finite, namely in the allegory of the cave as truth versus appearances. 
And if you follow these lectures, you'll see that there's thereby a, 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 an analogous feature between the idea of essence and truth and the idea of the, uh, sorry, essence and truth and the infinite. Whereas objects and the appearance of objects is thereby associated with the finite. If this is relatively new to you, the essential juxtaposition that we find within idealism going back to Plato is the juxtaposition or the binary difference between the idea of essence, truth, and the idea of appearance, which thereby is illusion. And what appears to you is thereby finite, and what is inaccessible to you is infinite or truth. Now, one of the Hegelian innovations, which I'll come to in a little bit, is to essentially posit that the infinite and the finite shouldn't be considered um, opposed to each other in this binary sense. In fact, this is Hegel's entire point when he accuses Schelling of engaging in a so-called spurious infinite. And this is one of those rare occasions where the English translation actually has a little bit of a nicer connotation than the German version. Hegel essentially juxtaposes two types of infinite, what you might call the true infinite and the false infinite, or the true infinite and the spurious infinite. The true infinite is wahre Unendlichkeit, and false infinity, in other words, the spurious infinity, is falsche Unendlichkeit. And spurious, I think, contains a degree to which, which is more Hegelian, which is the idea that it's not just that the true and the false are juxtaposed to each other, but that the true emerges within the false as such. But let's present, first of all, in a little bit more clear fashion, what Hegel means by a false infinity. So Hegel essentially accuses Schelling, and thereby also Fichte, of positing two forms of a false infinity. One, a, an open-ended sequence of finites, which you might refer to as n plus one. In fact, if you know the famous left-leaning magazine, N plus one, this is an allusion to this open-ended sequence, which Hegel would thereby call false. N plus one simply means that whatever you have can be extended ad nauseum. It can be extended into the future. For example, in the LGBTQ plus sequence, here we have N plus one, N being all the letters and the plus being the symbol by which the letters can be extended. This is also the sort of famous deterministic optimistic framing of Martin Luther King that the arc of justice, uh, this is, I always misquote it, but that the, someone will help me here, that the arc of justice moves forward or something like this. That there's an infinite forward thrust of progress that will never reach its endpoint, that the endpoint is unknowable, that it has a kind of open horizon of course, in romantic terms, this is associated with a kind of freedom. Think about the pirates setting sail into the horizon or the cowboy who is riding off into the sunset. The notion of going into something that is an infinitely expanding horizon is thereby the positing of certain false infinitive. Now, what makes it false? Essentially, what makes it false is that the infinite thereby exists as a kind of supplement to the positing of a further sequence of finite positions. The way in which Schelling describes this is as a, as, a, as a chain in which we have infinite links that are constantly added to each other, and we don't know what the end point is. The Hegelian proposition about the infinite, although I find this not entirely accurate and perhaps slightly too Koyavian, is the idea of a closed circle instead. It's something that has no end point, that is not posited at the end as such. So that is one version of the false infinite, the idea of a uh, essentially a... Um, a one-sided infinite that moves in one direction only. Then we have another version of the false infinite, which Hegel accuses Schelling of, which is the positing of an absolute or an infinite that is beyond or outside the realm, the barriers of human cognition, which is to say that it is unknowable. And so either we have a one-sided infinite, which is simply the repetition ad nauseum into the horizon, n plus one, if you want to put it in mathematical terms, or we have the idea of an absolute that is simply not knowable, of an infinite that exists outside the horizon of human understanding, that is thereby elevated into a kind of spiritual transcendence because it cannot be known or reached, a kind of nirvana point. Of course, some of you would argue you can reach nirvana, but you get my point. Now, the issue here, and you may have already noticed this, is I've snuck in another term, 
I started referring to the infinite as the absolute. And here comes the key disagreement between Hegel and Schelling, and yet also the key transitory passage between Schelling and Hegel, which is the emphasis on the absolute. Remember, I argued that the way in which it is commonly taught is that we have sub Fichtian subjective idealism, followed by Schellingian objective idealism, and then the unification into Hegelian absolute idealism. And yet this fundamental triad has a problem, which is that it seems to ignore the fact that it is in fact Schelling's achievement to posit the idea of the absolute. That the absolute is not something that Hegel comes up with out of his own volition, that the absolute is something that he engages with through Schelling. When Schelling refers to the absolute thereby, he is essentially referring to an infinite that cannot be known, an infinite that can only make itself manifest through finite experience, like a trickle-down absolute. And the name of this infinite that cannot be accessed for Schelling is the absolute. This is where Schelling becomes a more mystical thinker, which is with his emphasis on Natur philosophie, the idea that nature is thereby the kind of underlying ground of all existence that cannot be fully known or understood, it can only be lived. This is the positing of the absolute. What's key here is what, I'm going very fast also, I apologize, but there's a lot to put in here. What's key here, remember I mentioned this earlier, is the idea of the indivisible remainder. And the idea of the indivisible remainder is something that Salvo Zizek has actually worked with. Of course, in characteristically Zizekian fashion, he likens this indivisible remainder to the Lacanian real, but I'll return to that at the end of this lecture. I was curious when I saw the word indivisible remainder, which Zizek uses frequently throughout his, throughout his books, and yet for some reason is never actually in the um, index or in the footnotes. I became curious where this came from. And the most direct allusion to the indivisible remainder we can find in Zizek's book on Schelling, which is called The Indivisible Remainder on Schelling and Related Matters. And yet even in this book, Zizek doesn't, to my knowledge, properly attribute this idea or this concept, the indivisible remainder, to any thought within Schelling as such. So I did a little bit of digging into uh, what is known as the Schellingian Freiheitsschrift, which is a short, shorter version for a longer German name. Essentially, the Freiheitsschrift is his article on freedom. It's something that Schelling wrote late in his life, and it's considered one of the most important texts of German idealism. And within, I think it's page 29 of that text, we have in the English translation the mention of the indivisible remainder. But I wanted to know what is the German for it, and is the German as interesting as the English? And so I went back to the German text and tried to locate the same page in the same argument. And after some reading, in fact, I was successful. And so the passage, I actually have it for you here because it's quite interesting. The passage in which Schelling refers to the indivisible remainder, he actually describes the indivisible remainder as der nie aufgehende Rest. Now, der nie aufgehende Rest is slightly different than the indivisible remainder. Namely, something which never aufgeht. Something which is never in the process of aufgehen. Now, if you don't know German, you might wonder, what does aufgehen mean? Well, aufgehen, and this is where it becomes quite lovely because it's almost like, an, it's almost like a precedent to what Hegel ends up doing with sublation. The word aufgehen can be translated in at least three different ways. We can have something rising, for example, die Sonne geht auf, the sun is rising. We can have something opening, for example, der Mund geht auf, I'm opening my mouth. Or, and this is key, you can have the mathematical process by which something is solved or resolved. And you can have aufgehen as, a for, as like a mathematical problem that is being solved. <clears throat> and so here we have a beautiful, uh, if you will, triad of different meanings in the original German that render aufgehen in a very different way from indivisible. Indivisible means something that cannot be divided, whereas something that is a remainder, a rest, that is nie aufgehend, here we have the continuative process of nicht aufgehen, is something which thereby is neither rising, nor is it opening, nor is it resolving. 
If you're a Hegelian, your ears will immediately perk up. Because isn't the famous Hegelian idea of Aufhebung thereby the antithesis to something which nie aufgeht. And Aufhebung, if you're not familiar with the Hegelian German, which I don't expect you to be, is the Hege what is usually translated into the idea of sublation. Now, within Hegelian sublation, the idea of Aufhebung, we have at least two meanings. One, to rise something up, but also to retain it, to keep it. And so we have what appears to be an antithetical movement, a, a, a beautiful wordplay that Hegel is using here, which is the idea that something is being lifted, it is raised, sort of like a classic transcendental movement, but it is also being retained, it is being withheld. And so we have something that is both the process of rising up, of being transcendent, but also being withheld from us. It's seemingly uh, as contradictory experience, although which for Hegel would be dialectical. Now I'm very tempted to say that this process of sublation can thereby be rendered in contrast with the Schillingian idea of the indivisible remainder, namely something which is never rising, it is never opening, and it is never resolving. After all, in the passage in which Schelling refers to the indivisible remainder, indivisible remainder is code for the absolute, namely the absolute which is withheld from you. In fact, in the passage, Schelling says that everything that exists in the world, in the world of light, has underneath it a core of darkness, of the void, essentially, that is there and could at any point break through, that could at any point suddenly appear. Of course, for those of you who are followers of Zizek, you will recognize here something that Zizek would liken to the Lacanian real, something which is perpetually underneath the surface that comes breaking through, the return of the repressed, or the, the idea of the, the real making itself manifest. But again, we can return to that. And so here we have the Schillingian problem of the absolute or the infinite as being unknowable, as being under the surface, that within the world of appearances, there are certain cracks, almost like the glitch in the matrix, through which the darkness underneath and the absolute, the void, comes raging through. And you can imagine Hegel in his phenomenology of spirit and the process of sublation, thereby positing that sublation is the unfolding of the indivisible remainder. In other words, you could argue that the process of sublation or Aufhebung is the manner in which the indivisible remainder is indivisible from within. In other words, that der nie aufgehende Rest is always in the process of niemals aufgehen. That rather than being fixed and withheld from us as the foundation underlying the finite and the existence of things, that it is rather within the existence of things themselves that we have the constant regurgitative process of the unfolding of what Hegel would call spirit, or der aufgehende Rest, to link it back to Schelling. Here we can go back to the argument I made at the beginning, which is that we have a vanishing mediator between the idea of the Fichte and positing of the subjective self, subjective idealism, versus the Schillingian return to a non-subjective, objective idealism, and then the Hegelian idea of an absolute idealism. However, this is where it's key to emphasize, especially for people who are relatively new to this, that the entire project of Zizek's Lacanian reading of Hegel is precisely to argue against the idea of a solipsistic Hegel of the absolute, to argue against the triad by which Fichte deposits a subjective idealism, which is then returned to an objective idealism in Schelling, and that is then closed into this unifying circle of Hegelian absolute idealism. In other words, it's an argument that goes against the very drive towards understanding Hegel as a thinker of closedness, a, a thinker who, in a sense, closes Pandora's box of German idealism. That would be sort of a vulgar caricature of the Hegelian idea of the absolute. Instead, what is really important here is that Hegel takes the two attitudes of the spurious infinitive, infinitive namely the open-sidedness, the n plus one, and the incompleteness, namely the fact that it is not known, that it cannot be reached, and he merges this into his own ideological proposition. Now, what is that ideological proposition? This is where it's gonna get a little bit technical, so. Hold on to your seatbelts. 
Look at the word infinite. The word infinite is not simply the opposite of the finite. It is infinite. It is that which is negated within the finite itself. Now, if that doesn't seem entirely convincing within the English word infinite, if you look at the German for infinite, the German word for infinite is unendlich. Endlich means something that has an end. In other words, something that is finite. Unendlich is thereby not something which does not have an end, but something which within the finite has no finite. To go back briefly to something we talked about in a previous lecture with the idea of un, which we find, for example, in the word uh, the unconscious, or we find within the uncanny, the German un always points towards a certain uncertainty within something which is posited as such. Not its negation, but a kind of internalized negation. The classic way in which this is usually rendered, which Zizek also uses, and which is in Hegel, is the difference between determinate, but, sorry, between infinite judgment and the idea of determinate negation. Infinite judgment, according to Kant, is whenever you have the affirmation of a predicate and the negation of a predicate. For example, something is alive or it is not alive. Hegel then posits that we have the affirmation of a non-predicate, which he takes from Kant as well. So what is the affirmation of a non-predicate? Well, in characteristically Zizekian fashion, I've mentioned this before, the example that Zizek uses is the zombie, the zombie film, the zombie character, which is that the zombie is neither dead nor alive. In a sense, he represents, he symbolizes that which exists between life and death as such. Hence also the Freudian term uncanny. What is uncanny in German, and German, the German makes more sense here than the English, is unheimlich. Namely, that which undermines from within that which is familiar to us, the unfamiliar, the uncanny. And so what we fear thereby is something that is the representative of the kind of, again, indivisible remainder, if you will, between the affirmation of a predicate and the negation of a predicate. If you will, you could call it the negation of a negation of a predicate, which isn't just a convenient bit of Hegelese. After all, Hegel defines the infinite as the negation of the negation. And so now you can see how unendlich, and I find this a little bit mind-blowing once you piece it together, how unendlich, the infinite, is thereby the negation of negation that is represented within the word un itself. And so in the same way that infinite judgment, namely the un between the affirmation of a predicate and the negation of the predicate, which is thereby the affirmation of a non-predicate, it can be read as code for the negation of negation. The negation of negation is thereby not the, uh, sorry, not the affirmation of the predicate, which would be the thesis, nor is it the negation of a predicate, which would be the, the contradictory, the antithesis, if you will, to put it in a vulgar fiction sense, but then becomes the affirmation of a non-predicate. And the giving substantive material body to that which is not, for example, the zombie, is thereby the negation of the negation. Negation of negation being code for Hegel for the infinite, which makes a lot more sense in German, namely unendlich, that which is uncanny within the finite itself. Now, if you've been able to follow that, because I know this is a lot, and perhaps it's easier to see in text, is that Essentially, what Hegel thereby argues is that the infinite, rather than being the antithesis to the finite, is in fact the very limit between the finite negating itself, which is a huge ontological proposition, which I've mentioned before, Hegel's ontology being rather than having the absolute from which subjective reason is the fall, it's that the absolute emerges after the fall or retroactively. In other words, that it emerges within, not reason, but within that which is negated within reason itself. In other words, what Hegel calls self-relating negativity or bestimmte negation, which we can relate back to the term I used before, which is the idea of determinate negation. And so determinate negation becomes linked to the idea of the un within the unendlich, which is code for the negation of negation. Namely, neither the affirmation of a predicate nor the negation of, uh, or, uh, nor the negation of a predicate, but the affirmation of a non-predicate. These are a lot of different pieces, but over the course of the previous lectures, hopefully you'll start being able to piece them together. Um, at least that's my hope here. I know that this is technical.
but also exciting, I think. And so, essentially, what we have here is that the infinite is nothing less and nothing more than negation within the finite itself. And so we've liberated ourselves from a kind of uh, Kantian formalism, which is the Kantian formalism of positing the finite versus the infinite, and rather seeing that it's not the finite within the infinite, but fundamentally the other way around. That the infinite emerges only within the infinite positing of self-relating negativity within the finite itself. And now, finally, you can see how Hegel thereby becomes the result of the vanishing mediating process between Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. If Fichte is the one who emphasizes finite knowing, namely subjective reason, subjective idealism, as the key category for the world, and Schelling contradicts this with a return to an, an incompleteness of reason, namely the positing of an absolute that lies underneath an indivisible remainder, a nie aufgehende Rest, that Hegel comes in, and Hegel thereby universalizes the Fichtean subjective idealist position into its universal position, which is thereby that of the absolute. To put that a little bit dense, less densely, to essentially argue that the subjective positing of reason is the manner in which the absolute unfolds. In other words, that the indivisible remainder lies not outside of reason, but lies within subjective reason as such. And here to like just do some Hegel 101, here you can see the, 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 the most famous difference that Hegel posits between reason and understanding, between Vernunft, reason, and Verstand, understanding. Essentially what Hegel argues, going back to Kant, is that we have a difference between reason and understanding. Reason, capital R reason for Hegel, is knowing in the absolute, knowing knowing itself, if you will. Very technical, but let's leave it there for a moment. Verstand is knowing in the actual world. It's the things that you can know that appear to you. In other words, knowing or Verstand, which is, okay, this is where the German English gets confusing. I shouldn't say it's going to make me more confusing than it is. Verstand for most Germans sounds like understanding, but for Hegel it's not. But pretend I didn't say that because it's already hard enough. So we have, to put it very formulaically, we have Verstand and Vernunft. Verstand is finite knowing. Vernunft is absolute knowing. However, instead of having Verstand being worldly knowing that is cut off from the transcendental horizon of Vernunft or capital R reason, it is only within Verstand that Vernunft emerges. In other words, it's only within finite knowing that the absolute horizon of, of reason, capital R reason, emerges. And thereby, Hegel has made a monumental ontological shift away from Kant, away from Fichte, away from Schelling, and thereby seemingly uniting them, yet also undermining them. In other words, Hegel is the concluding sequence of a vanishing mediation between Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel by which the proposition of a subjectively oriented idealism, which starts with the famous Kantian Copernican turn, is universalized into the Schellingian absolute and yet fades away in its very properties, emerging into the fully-fledged Hegelian idealism. An idealism that is thereby closed precisely because it is radically opened. Not opened, and this is key, in the sense of one-sidedness or incompletion. Not a spurious infinity that moves towards an empty horizon of the absolute, but an absolute that has been transposed back into the finite itself. And this is what Hegel calls a true infinite. The opposite of a false infinite. The unification of the Kantian project in its two antithetical forms, namely Fichtean subjective idealism and Schellingian objective idealism, find themselves in what Hegel determined to be the key task of philosophy, which is to grasp the infinite, which for Hegel is code for the negation of negation. And the manner in which the negation of negation unfolds is the Hegelian dialectic, the dialectical unfolding of spirit as reason that emerges within Verstand, namely Vernunft that arises within Verstand. And this process by which Hegel seemingly closes German idealism and yet ontologically rupturing it and fundamentally opening it is his alternative to what he accuses of being a spurious infinitive, namely the process by which you find a true infinitive. Hence also why Hegel, in characteristically 
flamboyant fashion, although Hegel wasn't flamboyant, but his writing certainly is. Well, no, okay, let me put it like this. This is gonna be rude. Hegel's writing is not flamboyant. In fact, it's very, very dense. And the way in which he delivered his lectures was so dense that was totally inscrutable to people. And yet his claims are so fundamentally flamboyant because once you, once you get to the core of them, they're very dramatic. It's just that it takes a lot of work to get there. And so in characteristically flamboyant fashion, to retain that word, Hegel essentially posits that he has completed philosophy. Hegel puts down his pen and writes, I mean, he writes before he puts down his pen, this is the end of philosophy, the end of history. I have completed philosophy. And of course, in some sense, Hegel was correct. Hegel had completed a fundamental movement within the trajectory of human thought, which was the Fichtian, Schillingian, antithetical, quote unquote, solutions to the Kantian problem of the manner in which reason or the absolute can be known subjectively. Kant's critique of pure reason was the positing of a problem which Hegel thereby believed that he had solved. And ever since Hegel, philosophy has never been the same. In fact, you could argue that ever since Hegel to practice philosophy means to practice anti-philosophy, to move away from the classic platonic binary towards a dialectical unfurling of the idea of history and philosophy. Hence also why after Hegel, we suddenly start seeing all the other disciplines becoming philosophical, that the fundamental importance of Marxism was precisely the introduction of political economy into the Hegelian dialectic, that the importance of, of Feuerbach was the emphasis, although I'm not a Feuerbachian, the emphasis on religion, that the importance of Freud was the emphasis on psychoanalysis, that through Hegel, we suddenly have this rupturing by which philosophy has been completed and the world has become philosophized. And that is a revolution in human thought that I think cannot be stated enough how exciting it is and remains today. And so the purpose of this lecture series was to introduce the idea of the spurious infinity and what Hegel posits as a true infinitive alternative, namely the infinity of the dialectic, the infinity of the negation of negation. And what we will be doing in the lecture series starting next week is to inquire further into what exactly this indivisible remainder is, and it is going to be an introduction to the Hegelian dialectic, see through a Zizekian Lacanian lens. Thank you guys so much. Um, it's been my pleasure to host this series. The last lecture is always the hardest, but I really hope that this, is, that this was helpful to you in your own study and your own reading of Hegel and, and other thinkers. Um, if you'd like to go back and watch all the previous lectures, they're all saved for free on YouTube and Instagram. Anybody can watch them. In fact, it's my pleasure to have them open access. And thank you to the patrons who allow me to keep all of these classes open access and available for everyone. I'm truly so grateful, so grateful to be sharing in this space for, with you and to be starting my week in communal, philosophical fashion. If you'd like to download all of these lectures, and if you'd like to support this project as we go into the next lecture series, and of course, if you'd like to get your hands on the accompanying ebook, which will be titled Spurious Infinities, which will replace my previous ebook, Sisyphus and Love, which is available for one more week only, because if you didn't know already, every time I release a new ebook for the lecture series, I delete the previous ebook because I like moving forward together. If you'd like to download the ebook, and in fact, if you'd like to get two ebooks for the price of one, please do sign up to www.patreon.com forward slash Gentleline and Julian. Thank you guys so much. It's my pleasure to host this. And in about 20 minutes, I'm gonna go on Discord to have another Q&A session, which patrons can access and download as a podcast. Thank you guys so much, and I will see you next week.